Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. I think by the usual set of three greetings. Um, I'm Fraser. You may have seen me speaking and doing other bits of conference work already uh, this week. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce, start again, to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Greg Stokowski from the University of Krakow in Poland. And Greg is currently the president of the International Olympiad for astronomy and astrophysics. And he's going to be telling us all about the International Olympiads. Greg, you have probably the best part of an hour or so to tell us everything. Um, we'll jump in towards the end of the hour if, if you're still going. Can you hear me okay? And can you speak just so we can check we can hear you? Can you, can you hear me? Uh, it's a bit slow, Greg. Sorry? It's a bit low, your voice. Just that. Uh, is that better? Uh, barely. <laughs> um, let me just check if it's using the right microphone because. Yeah, uh, put, put it closer to your mouth, maybe. Yeah, I put this uh, headset. So. It's no, not, it's not. It's I, not picking up from your headset. I think it's picking up from your laptop, maybe. It's on Zoom, uh, bottom left, the arrow by the side of the microphone, you can select the, the input. How's this? Is this better? Uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try the, oh no, hang on. Ah, sorry, I need to adjust the volume and it switched back to the other microphone. Is this better? No. Still very low. Very low. Um, oh dear. Um, okay, what about this one? There you go. That's perfect. Gustavo, are you happy with that? Yes. Yeah, we hear you fine now, Greg. If you're, are you ready to share slides as well? We can just check that's working. And then we'll leave you alone for an hour. Okay, we've lost your mic again. So your slides look fine. Uh, we've lost you on camera, which isn't too big an issue, but we can't hear you right now. So the camera's back. We still don't hear you. Right. Okay. You muted. Right. Try again. It's okay. It's a Zoom thing, right? We can blame Zoom for everything. Don't worry. There was something you did about a minute ago where everything worked absolutely fine. And we heard you loud and clear just for one or two sentences. So the technical term we use here, if you have a, a headset that's plugged into the side of your machine, is to give it a wiggle and just see if that connects something a bit more. Gustavo, shall I do my jokes while we wait? That's uh, that. Try again, Greg. I think that was OK. Say something, Greg. I think we can hear you. Um, how's this? Can you hear me now? It's the best it's been. It's not. It's it's a little bit quiet, but I think we're okay, right, Gustavo? Right. Yeah. It doesn't like the camera very much, um, so I'm okay. going to do it without the camera for now. And <laughs> the camera back. Uh, I think it's better to hear you than see you at this stage. I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So I'll put the camera back later when I finish. No problem. Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so uh, yes. Um, uh, I've already been introduced, I suppose, but uh, just to um, underline that, I, I do work at the Pedagogical University in Krakow in Poland, and um, I've been involved with the International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics for uh, 14 years now, right since the, since the first one, um, and um, I'm lucky enough to be the, the current president of that organization, which means I help organize uh, each year's uh, event. And um, I'm also uh, an IAU uh, National Astronomy Education Coordinator. 
from my country. Some of you may have heard of that um, initiative. It's also a, a, a very good way to disseminate astronomy education, information and resources um, uh, across the world, which is a, a new IAU thing. And uh, Gustavo asked me to talk about um, the, the International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics, and I thought I'd do it slightly more broadly and talk uh, about astronomical Olympiads more generally as, uh, as part of the astronomical education and, and what we can uh, use the Olympiads for to, to motivate uh, students um, and, and improve astronomy education more generally using the IOAA uh, as an example of that. Um, so I'll, I'll first of all I'll talk about what uh, what Olympiads are and why and where they where they come from. And I think there are sometimes some uh, misconceptions uh, about this uh, from what I've encountered uh, talking to to teachers, other people in education. Um, I'll explain what the International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics itself is, how it works, what we do, and talk a little bit about, about what I was saying about Olympiads uh, in the wider context of astronomy education. Uh, so I hope that will be uh, interesting for you. And um, I wanted to start with uh, this uh, quotation, which is from the International Olympic Committee, the people who organize the sports Olympics. Um, because it very much applies also to what uh, the academic Olympiad movement has always been about and is trying to do. So th this, is, this is directly taken from uh, the International Olympic Committee materials. You can find this quotation on their website. And it goes back to, to the first iterations of the modern Olympic Games uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And the idea is that the goal of the Olympic movement is to contribute to building a better world by educating youth uh, without discrimination of any kind and in the Olympic spirit, which is the spirit of friendship and solidarity and fair play. And they apply this to sports, uh, but um, the, the people who came up with the first academic Olympiads, and this was again in about the, the 1920s, I think, um, last century, were very much motivated by the same idea that um, we can extend this concept of friendly competition um, to, to academic fields, to the sciences, to mathematics. Mathematics, I think, was the first one, in fact, um, to do this and, and use that to, to build, um, build this idea of, of cooperation and friendship across boundaries, across countries and cultures uh, and, and people. And uh, this, is, this is something I think sometimes gets forgotten. Um, many people who are involved in teaching, who I've encountered, are somewhat wary of competitions because uh, it's often seen that competitions are something which uh, perhaps discriminates pupils, school children who maybe have fewer resources or uh, less access to, to textbooks or teachers or other, uh, other means by which they can achieve the same level. And so, uh, so people are sometimes afraid to, to involve uh, themselves with competitions in, because of that. And what I would like to try and do is to convince those of you who maybe have doubts about uh, competitions uh, and their applicability to education, uh, that it doesn't need to be that way. And this wasn't the, the aim of the Olympiad movement more generally, any more than it is in, in, in sports. So the first thing to, uh, to realize is that really any event can be an Olympiad in this sense. I'll get on to obviously the International Olympiad um, in a bit and, and the other international science olympiads but more generally speaking any competition any event uh, where school children pupils students can be brought in uh, to to do various tasks and activities can be considered to be an olympiad in this sense of trying to foster um, mutual understanding and, and, and friendship 
And the idea is that we should be encouraging students uh, through these competitions not to beat, try and beat other students, not to dominate, not to do anything like that, but to, to beat themselves, to be their best. And that's the, that's the idea of the sporting Olympic movement. And it carries over very well into how uh, those of us who are involved in the academic Olympiads understand that, uh, that idea and that, that goal as well. So um, how, can we, how can we do that? Well, we, we can set up uh, situations and events which challenge, challenge the students. A lot of things which uh, school children learn at school are very much formulaic. They, they follow a set pattern. They often don't um, include maybe the latest developments in, in a field. They don't necessarily challenge uh, the brightest students. Um, and even even less bright students can sometimes feel like like they're like they're on a bit of a treadmill that they're doing exercises which other people have done before um, that you know the answers to the experiments that you do and this kind of thing um, and through things like the academic olympiads we can challenge the students take them out of that box take them out of that uh, intellectual comfort zone not to make them uncomfortable personally but take them out of that intellectual comfort zone and, and stretch them and give them some kind of motivation and structure to think and, and learn um, uh, about these subjects. We're talking more broadly than astronomy here. Uh, think and learn about these subjects uh, for themselves. And the uh, second important thing that these events do is it gives uh, these children the opportunity to meet other children like them, other children who are very interested in these academic pursuits. It's pretty easy for a, a child who is into football to meet other children who are into football. It's pretty much universal. Um, whereas um, a child who is interested in astronomy, maybe they're the only child in their class who is interested in astronomy. Maybe they're the only child in their village or, 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 or their town or in their social circle who is interested in astronomy. And by providing uh, events like these Olympiads where children from um, a region or a country or around the world are brought together, they suddenly discover that there are all these other, other kids, um, other students who are into, into the same thing. And that is, you, you can see it as somebody who has been to these events for many years. Um, as an organizer, you can see it happening. You can see this realization um, on their faces uh, as they realize that they're united in this. And that is, a, that is I think, a very important aspect. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, the school curricula are often fairly formulaic. In many countries, sometimes uh, astronomy is not at all in the curriculum or in only a minimal amount. So uh, these Olympiads can introduce new material to the student's sort of knowledge base, knowledge sphere. And as long as we structure it so that it rewards um, personal achievement, so that the student is, is competing against themselves in a sense, rather than a competition against others primarily, then, then there's, there's really uh, nothing, nothing negative about it. So we're trying to channel the, the natural competitiveness of students as well. And many children are simply naturally competitive. You see that in, in playground games and, and other things. Um, the, the, the aim here is to channel that uh, into a positive, positive goal. And there's a side effect, of course, of the International Olympiads, which is that uh, for many kids, this is sometimes the first time they've been uh, outside their immediate um, area outside their region outside their country um, seen cultures uh, and people that are completely different um, to themselves environments that are completely different to themselves and that again is something um, which is a rare opportunity for for, for many of these um, children even even children from uh, western uh, relatively wealthy western countries um, uh, where, where travel might be more expected, shall we say. Even then, they, they, they don't necessarily go to the sort of places that an Olympiad will go. Uh, you'll see in a few slides a list of countries that we've been to with the International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics. And some of those are places where it's fairly unlikely that, that a, a student might choose to go uh, on their own or be able to go on their own. 
So this is this is another sort of side effect, which may be not the primary goal, but it is one which is very good for developing this sort of sense of a global community, I think. So uh, this is the list of uh, International Science Olympiads more generally. Uh, the first one founded uh, was the International Mathematical Olympiad that was in, in, in the 1950s. And since then, uh, the, the list has grown. Uh, there are also now Olympiads in non-science subjects as well, history, uh, economics, I think, and several others. But these, these are the ones that are usually grouped under the, the science Olympiads. Um, and in the at the end of the previous talk, uh, Christian uh, was asking Sylvia about uh, participation of Italy and uh, the, the, the topic there mentioned the, the other uh, International Astronomy Olympiad, and, and that is in fact true, there are two International uh, Olympiads uh, which are based around the, the topic of astronomy. Um, the, the difference here is that uh, the way they're organised and, and the, the sort of themes and the subject matter is different. Uh, the International Astronomy Olympiad, this is the first one that you can see in orange in the middle there in 1996, is based on sort of longer type of problems, um, more involved, and uh, the, the structure and the way it's organized is, is somewhat different to the other science Olympiads more generally. Uh, what happened uh, was that in 2006, at a meeting of the International Physics Olympiad, which was happening that year um, in, I think it was in Thailand, if I remember correctly, but I might be wrong about that. But anyway, at the International Physics Olympiad in, in 2006, several uh, of the representatives of the countries that were attending, and the International Physics Olympiad is basically the largest of the science Olympiads, except for mathematics. Uh, there are something like 80, 80 odd countries that participate. So um, several of those countries got together and uh, discussed the issue of, of astronomy um, and, and representation, of, representation of astronomy in the International Science Olympiads and came to the conclusion that uh, perhaps a, uh, an alternative Olympiad uh, which would be more structured in terms of the way it's, it's run, in terms of the type of problems, um, generally the, the whole scheme, uh, which is more aligned with the other International Science Olympiads, uh, would be a good idea. And the, they tried this uh, in 2007, uh, about 20, 20 something countries uh, turned up. And since then it's been happening every year and it's been growing every year. So it's obviously uh, fulfilling a need. Now, there's no reason for both to not coexist. Uh, the world's a big place, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of students and more events like this mean more opportunity for more students to, to participate in something like this. So uh, we see nothing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's no conflict between, between our two events. Some uh, countries participate in one, some countries participate in both, some countries participate in the other. So there's, there's, no, there's no issue there. And um, as far as participation of any countries uh, which only participate in the International Astronomy Olympiad um, goes um, very welcoming of, of them if they want to want to join IOAA and, and, and come to IOAA as well. Um, absolutely no problem with that or the other way around as well. So um, that I hope answers that question um, for, 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 for the moment. So these are the International Science Olympiads. Going to the IOA, you can see that it was uh, first run in 2007. And it's been, it's been run every year since then. We've been lucky enough to, to be able to, to organize it, to be able to find uh, funding and host uh, countries and so on. Um, generally, these uh, events last uh, approximately 10 days, nine, 10 days, that seems to be the sweet spot between balancing the availability of uh, people to be able to participate, come and participate, take time off from other things, funding, and uh, on the other hand, the need to, to, to squeeze in all the, all the events uh, that take place. There are obviously 
um, the, the academic events themselves, which I'll describe in a moment, but also cultural events, uh, field trips, visits to, um, uh, to various significant places, and so on that, that are there to, to, to do this sort of cultural exchange that I was mentioning earlier. So uh, for the IOAA, each country sends a team of five students, uh, and two adult leaders. We don't uh, really uh, interfere with how those teams are chosen. We leave that to the individual countries. Um, mostly they, they run some form of uh, selection process, whether that's a national Olympiad or, or some um, other um, other event uh, by which they, they, they select the, the students. And two adult team leaders whose role is to, to uh, obviously watch over the, the students when they're traveling. These are generally uh, people who are not necessarily uh, adults, not necessarily 18 years old, uh, but also uh, they vet and uh, check the questions to make sure that the questions are, uh, are uh, correct uh, in terms of the, uh, the science and the, the, the what, what's going on in the questions and uh, also they're responsible for translation so the students don't necessarily need to know English to be able to participate and the way we've done this so far we've been lucky enough that uh, the host country has been able to cover uh, all the accommodation expenses so the, the, the teams only spent pay for their travel costs and as I was saying, cultural events are part of the part of the process. So these are the host countries that we've had uh, so far in order. Some of them have, uh, have repeated. Um, in brackets, you have the the cities uh, where we've been, and you, you can see that there's a, a reasonably wide range. Uh, we haven't really broken into North America in terms of hosting uh, yet. Uh, but I'll show you. I'll show you a map in a moment. Um, and uh, most recently, uh, the the actual physical IOAA happened in in Keste, in Hungary. This is a town which is on the edge of Lake Balaton, the largest lake in in Hungary. It's a very beautiful uh, location. And we were planning to go to Colombia last year, but of course, because of uh, obvious reasons that had to be uh, put off. It will be happening in a hybrid form this year where we will have the academic committee uh, in Colombia, but uh, the students will not be physically coming to Colombia. They will be um, in their host co home countries and we will have uh, packets of, uh, of materials sent to them so they can do that. And hopefully next year we will be back to normal service. Um, in, in lieu of that, uh, last year we organized uh, something which we called the Global E-Competition on Astronomy and Astrophysics, just to differentiate it a bit from, from IOA, especially as this was the first time uh, we were organizing something online and we weren't sure quite how, how we would be able to navigate the, the difficulties of translating the competition process to, to the online form. It actually went very well. Um, Finland was the host for that in terms of providing the infrastructure, much of the academic committee, all of the hosting for the for the, um, uh, the services that were needed to do that. So in a sense, they, they, they were the host of the, the IOAA in, in 2020 and will be counted, counted in that way. And we have other host countries lined up um, for for the next uh, the next few years as well, um, that that is that's for another time. So we're we're going strong, and hopefully many years many years still in front of uh, the IOIA. Uh, so this is the map I was mentioning. This was done recently by my uh, colleague Aniket Sule, and friend, um, and secretary of the IOIA as well. Uh, the, the countries in blue are countries which participate regularly in, in the IOA. In green, we have past hosts who are also uh, usually participating, in fact, always participating as well. And apart from that, there have also been some countries which have participated on and off. They've uh, maybe come to one or, or more IOAs. Usually this is uh, an issue with being able to secure the financial support uh, for, for the travel costs. And, They've maybe come to uh, events which are closer to them 
the, where the travel is cheaper uh, and not come to, to ones where, where the, the travel costs were, were more expensive. We can see that most of Europe is now covered. We're, we're still missing a few countries like Italy and France and, and Spain in participating. And um, we also have uh, most all of North America pretty much. Um, we're missing uh, almost all of Africa. And this is one of the, uh, the sort of big things that we're working on is to try and uh, help the astronomical community in, in Africa with uh, participation when they, uh, should they wish to do so. I mean, we're, we're talking to, to representatives from several countries. This is where also the IAU National Astronomy Education Coordinator Program is, is very helpful for that. And in South America, uh, many of these countries, they're white on this map, but they, is, but they will actually be participating um, in this year's IOAA in Colombia. So that will hopefully go uh, blue or at least orange uh, in, in the near future. Um, and in fact, this is the, the, the most recent sort of circular about the, the IOAA in, in Colombia. This is what Christian was talking about. You can see there's a, a welcome, uh, 53 countries are registered for this year. And uh, there's a welcome to, to several new countries, including Chile and Paraguay and Peru. Um, which will fill in that that, that South American uh, gap. Uh, I, I don't know what's going to <laughs> happen with the the, the Afghan uh, team, uh, given the situation there. But uh, we would like to to hope that they will be able to participate in some way. And we will certainly support them uh, as much as we can in doing so. So that's that's all in in progress now, and that hopefully gives you an idea of where we are on the sort of scale. Uh, numbers of participants and, and how this how this thing works. Um, on the on the structure of the competition, uh, this is uh, based or originally on the the structure of the Physics Olympiad, the International Physics Olympiad, and this is also similar to other science Olympiads uh, like chemistry, computing. Um, they they have a, a similar idea. Uh, way of doing things. So students, some students actually participate in more than one. We've had students participating in the physics and astronomy Olympiads, the computing and the astronomy Olympiads, in linguistics and astronomy Olympiads, and they find this familiarity also very, very useful for that purpose. So the IOAA is divided into three rounds. Um, we have theoretical problems, we have data analysis problems, and we have observation problems because this is astronomy, of course. Uh, so observation is a very important part of that. And this is something that's unique to, to astronomy. We, we can't do experiments in the way that we do experiments in, in physics or chemistry. We have to, have to take what's given, as it were, by the universe, observe that and, and work with it and all the problems that entails. So that's an important part. And the percentages here are the percentages of the final score, which, uh, which come from different, different sections. In addition to that, we do a couple of things which the other science Olympians don't do. We have a team competition and it's run differently to what you might expect. These are not national teams. I'll, I'll go into that in a moment and also post a competition. And uh, the way the, the medals and scores work is again similar to what is done in the other international science Olympians that uh, we're, we're not rewarding being first or second or third as much as we're rewarding being able to achieve a certain amount so anybody with over a certain percentage uh, of the scores will get a certificate of merit or they will get a bronze medal or a silver medal or a gold medal which means that the number of medals fluctuates we have a weighting system and a normalization system so that it's more or less consistent from year to year um, regardless of the number of participants or the number of um, or the number of, uh, or the difficulty of the questions, but uh, but it's uh, it's a fluctuating amount. So, a student that does that does very well will will get a gold medal, even if they're not in absolute score. Uh, you know, the, the first person. So that's that's one of the 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 important things, the important ways that we reward uh, personal achievement rather than, than competition. And as a side note, one of the way the principles we have when preparing the questions, writing the questions, 
in the IOIA is that we're always keeping in the back of our minds that this should be a learning experience for the students. So we're trying to um, not just test what they've already learned from school, but structure questions in a way which will maybe make them look at something they've already learned in a new way from a new light uh, or uh, lead them through how the physics or the astronomy that they've already learned can lead them to to new conclusions or to understanding objects that they haven't met before um, uh, things like that so we're, we're trying to to teach them as well as as, as test them it's not just turn up write a test and, and go away based on what you've already learned but we're trying to lead them through a, a sort of process of, of evolution of learning and growth hopefully that is something that that um, that is useful for them and given the the, the response so far and the, the, the popularity of the event um, the feedback we have it seems to be it seems to be working so the theoretical round is sort of the most classical um, exam type type round. The students get basically an exam type paper. Uh, they have theoretical problems. They have formulae. They have derivations. This sort of thing. Uh, one thing which maybe um, isn't uh, obvious is that we're we're very much aware of the differences in educational level um, in terms of the school curriculum between different countries and we're always trying to stay on top of that one of the things that uh, we know is that many countries don't teach calculus until university level so we don't require calculus problems are structured in such a way that they can always be solved without calculus even if calculus is, is one way of doing it so we're always on the lookout for that and also other similar similar things that that, that we're paying attention to and the, the questions are all uh, vetted before they're given to the students. They're all vetted by the international board. The international board is all the team leaders uh, attending an IOAA meeting together. And uh, the way it's done is that they are separated from the students. So once the process starts, once they see the questions, they have no way of communicating with the students to, to obviously ensure that the, the event is fair. Um, and they they sit down and we spend sometimes many hours going through the problems um, and, and making sure that they're they're correct and that there's there's nothing wrong that there's nothing missed no assumptions that shouldn't be there and, and so on. One of the benefits of doing this is this way is that many of the people who are attending are specialists in their field. So um, I'm primarily a binary star person, but there may be people who are involved with galaxies or, or, or uh, radio astronomy or other topics who, who will be attending the meeting and they'll be able to say um, you know this is right this is wrong um, another uh, thing is that many of the, the team leaders are also teachers or educators and they'll be able to say um, this is too difficult or this is not something that's taught in school or maybe this is taught in a different way at school and we can adjust the problems um, to make sure that it's all the way that, uh, that the students will will expect and that they'll have a positive experience with that so um, without obviously making it uh, too 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 simple for them um, the data analysis uh, one of the things this is kind of going back to the previous talk where um, real data was, was being presented to uh, to pupils and to to, to students uh, we think that that uh, we really should try and get away from this school idea of, of using constructed data and theoretical data. A lot of school experiments, you know what the answer is before before you you do it. So in our data analysis round, we provide the students with real data, whether it's spectroscopy, whether it's uh, photometric uh, data, all sorts of things. Um, we find ways of presenting that to the students that they can actually then analyze it and calculate, for example, the, the, the distance to a Cepheid based on real measurements of a real Cepheid um, star. So this is, this is a very, very interesting uh, thing. The, the organizers who are setting the questions are free to use any means necessary as long as it's uh, in, in inclusive of all of the students. So we've had uh, questions where the students have been put in front of computers and have been working on the computers uh, with suitable um, 
training beforehand to make sure that they can all use the software and so on. We've had uh, questions where they were shown a video of observations um, of the motion of uh, uh, the satellites of Jupiter and had to uh, make conclusions from that. We've had um, ones where they had to literally do photometry on a grid of measurements, aperture photometry on a grid of measurements simulating a CCD uh, image. Um, and we try and do that so that they, they get a feel for, for doing something that's not commonly done in school, um, which is using real data and using thing, methods like um, iteration to numerically solve a problem, graphing, um, error analysis is required in this section, so they have to uh, justify all of the, the, the steps in, in terms of the error balance and propagating errors through the thing. Um, and simple statistics, obviously we don't want to do, we can't go into very complicated statistical analysis because of time and because of uh, curricula, but means and medians and standard deviations and, and this kind of thing can, can be done. So this is again something that isn't necessarily covered well in, in schools that we try and do. And the final 25% is the observation. And again, this is underlying the difference from physics. Um, and there are many, many ways um, this can be done. It has been done from naked eye observation or using a telescope. Some, uh, sometimes there is a planetarium or sometimes there's planetarium and telescope observations. We haven't yet had solar or radio uh, observations during the IOA, but uh, I hope that will happen. And the students have been, um, they've been asked to identify objects, uh, measure uh, times, measure distance, uh, positions, measure uh, separations between objects, for example, position angle, this kind of thing. And depending again on the, 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 what the organizers have available or can, can fund, uh, the students have, have had telescopes, real telescopes set up uh, for them to use, for example, in this kind of thing. So in fact, I can uh, show you hopefully a video of that. This is a very short video from the IOA in Hungary made by one of the amateur astronomers um, who was there supporting it. Um, of the, the night observation ground uh, during that, that Olympiad. Uh, Raphael uh, was there. And it starts with a drone shot. This was actually uh, the football field, which uh, was next to the student accommodation in Keste in Hungary. And this is the, the array of 88 telescopes. They got 150 millimeter Newtonian telescopes on equatorial mounts. And these are the telescopes being set up before the, the, the round. These people grouped here are amateur astronomers who are drafted in to set up the telescopes and, uh, and support the whole process as, as a sort of source of manpower that, that understood how, how these things work. Um, and of course, once it got dark, that you can see in the background is, is Lake Balaton. Um, once it got dark, uh, the students, uh, well, the students arrived before it got dark, here they are familiarizing themselves with the, with the telescopes. Um, and once it got dark, of course, they started doing, uh, doing their observations. They had several tasks, finding objects and, and, and this kind of thing to do with those telescopes. This is a time lapse that's obviously been, been sped up. So um, you can see that the, the sky was uh, beautifully clear that evening, um, the, the bright light didn't actually interfere that much. It comes out more on camera. Um, that's from the, from the building in the background. But uh, this, is, this is the kind of, kind of event that, that takes place. And the observation round is always one which uh, is very, very popular with students because this is, again, something which many of them haven't experienced uh, through their school learning process. It's not something that, that happens very often. Um, so, sorry, let me try and switch those to go to the next slide. Come on. There it is. So the um, so the final rounds are the team competition and the poster competition. The poster competition is we try to encourage the students to do things outside of the Olympiad as well. So the poster competition is a way for them to present. Um, a conference style poster of their work either individually or as a group um, to other people 
many teams, many students don't participate in this. It's it's a voluntary thing, but there's there's some some award for the for the best poster and some judging process for that just to, to motivate them and get them again try and get them into the sort of vein of what doing real science is like and presenting presenting things. And the team competition is something that we're I think particularly proud of uh, among the organizers in that this has evolved over several iterations um, using feedback from the students and trying what worked what didn't work and what we've come up with uh, is that we take all of the students and they are sorted randomly into uh, into teams which are mixed so that all this all the participants uh, in a particular team come from different countries and uh, the teams traditionally we name after the constellations uh, and then we set them set them a task and it's usually the way it works is that they have um, an extended period of time to, to consider the task and think about how they're going to solve it so they might get presented the task somewhere near the beginning of the IOAA and have to present their solution uh, somewhere and somewhere towards the end and sometimes these tasks are more uh, geared towards uh, maybe doing something a bit fun uh, we've had one where they had to solve astronomical puzzles to do a sort of escape the room type uh, type thing where you have to you know find your way out of the of the puzzle but but the the questions and the, the tasks they had to solve were astronomical like you know calculating the time um based on the position of the stars this kind of thing or some of them have been more uh, more sort of academic task but they but they they require uh, all of them require um, skills and knowledge and the, the 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 way it is structured is that they have to collaborate they these are not things that one of the team can do and the rest of them sit around um, not doing anything getting bored they have to they have to collaborate to to do this and this is also um a competition where very frequently we find that um, members uh, the, the teams that do well are members uh, have members who maybe didn't necessarily do quite so well in the say the theoretical exam type rounds uh, where they have knowledge they have skills but maybe they don't have that sort of exam technique quote unquote uh, that is necessary for, for you know being able to work efficiently through exam type problems in the theoretical round so it gives gives a broader spectrum of the students a chance to uh, to really achieve um, something for themselves and it's it's a very popular popular event popular part of the, the competition and not something that other you know, science olympiads or other competitions really do um, to my knowledge anyway um, so just briefly uh, going back to the global e-competition on astronomy and astrophysics you can if you type in gcar uh, into google you can find the website and find all of the problems and, and what happened and, and the results and video and so on from that but i just wanted to point out the uh, one of the two team competition questions uh, which were part of that which uh, where we used the fact that uh, the students were all scattered around the world and ask them to measure the distance of the moon using, uh, basically using the parallax method. So, so students would combine observations, a student in Europe would combine observations with uh, uh, their observations with the observations of a student in say India and another student in, in say North America. And thus they'd get a baseline and, uh, and, and be able to measure the distance to the moon using these sort of classical astronomical methods, which is something that we wouldn't be able to do if all of the students were in one place. And the I've shown just the beginning of the instructions here, but then it sort of guided them through the process of, of um, how to how to prepare and to present these 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 uh, observations and these results with the aim of again trying to to get them to think and work more like you would in, in science. So, so uh, uh, presentation of the methods, presentation of the results, discussion, discussion of the errors, presenting all of your data in, in suitable formats and so on. And there was, a, there was a scoring system which was designed to reflect that, uh, where uh, the actual, getting the actual correct answer wasn't uh, anywhere near as important as the methodology and the process that they, they, they'd followed. And that was all explained in the, in the instructions. And we got some absolutely brilliant um, solutions to this, some really, really excellent uh, work. And, and you can see that the students were really getting into it. And the way it was structured is you could have a student who had a 
go-to telescope or a CCD camera, and they'd have just uh, no more no more chance to do this well than a student who just had a protractor or a ruler and a Jacob's ladder and did the whole thing by eye because you couldn't you couldn't do it that way. So basically, it was it was inclusive um, uh, as much as possible and really pushing the student to do something that they wouldn't normally be able to to do in their school sort of environment. Um, so that's that's how the 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 IOA works. Maybe how it works uh, similarly to other international Olympiads. Um, many national Olympiads follow a similar model. Maybe they take ideas from the IOA in some parts, especially the national Olympiads of countries which are participating in the IOA often have evolved, for example, to have a more data analysis uh, component in their in their questions. This is true, particularly the Polish um, astronomical Olympiad, which I'm very familiar with, which was very much more theory based uh, until Poland started participating in the IOAA. And since then, they've introduced um, more data analysis type type problems and more of an emphasis on, on, on that. Um, error analysis and this kind of thing, which I think is good because this is something that is that is really often missing from school curricula. So um, we make all of the available, all of the materials from the uh, Olympiads available, and this is something that is, again, uh, a resource for anybody teaching astronomy. Um, obviously, the syllabus is there. The syllabus is good for for giving to, to students who want to learn on their own, maybe outside the school curriculum. It gives the topics that, that, that you know are fundamental to to learning astronomy and learning astrophysics. And um, in uh, the, the the question papers, the question papers are all translated. So again, there are plenty of astronomical resources in English, uh, but in many other languages, it's much more limited. Especially problem sets are often limited, and all of the the IOAA question papers are available in translation. All of them have solutions. The solutions may not be translated, but one assumes that the teacher can at least follow that. Um, but, but they have the ready, ready translated questions and new sets of questions each year. And uh, there are several problem books published based on, on the, um, the Olympiad problems. Uh, this is the book that Anikat uh, put together based on the first, uh, I think, first eight or so years or, or 10 years, I forget exactly, of IOA problems where he went through the problems, selected uh, the more interesting ones, grouped them more by topic and added also a discussion of, 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 of the problem with multiple solutions and this kind of thing, which is the book that's now in its second edition and is, 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 has been proved very popular. There are, there are several translations of this that have been done. Um, other national uh, Olympiads have published books based on either the IOA problems or their own uh, national problems from the training um, camp. So the, the, the Czechs have a, have a booklet that comes out every year based on that. Um, for example, other countries have done it, done it as well. So these are, these are resources that are available for anybody to use, teachers or students trying to learn about astronomy themselves. Um, these are resources that are out there for you and you can get out and for the most part freely available or just for the, the price of a printed book because printing costs cost money but we're not making profit on this um so the positive effects of olympiads generally international olympiads in particular um first of all is the obvious one of, of learning um, the, the students learn by preparing themselves for the olympiad they want to participate in the olympiad they want to uh, maybe travel to, to somewhere um, and, and so, so they sit down and they, they prepare. The Olympia provides structure from that, for that through the past papers, through the syllabus. Um, training programs. Many countries have, have training programs for their teams, but what often happens is that the, it's, it's just as easy to set up a training program for 10 students or 15 students as it is for five. So larger groups are being trained in these uh, astronomy uh, topics. Um, the syllabus has become a, a, an informal set for, for teaching astronomy in places where uh, maybe the school curriculum is lacking in that, but again, laying that out, so that's, a, that's another useful thing. And again, we try to keep up to date with the, the latest research, so 
uh, presenting that to the students in a way that that they can follow they can understand using school level knowledge mm -hmm. i already mentioned meeting other like-minded students from different countries um, and another aspect that's maybe less obvious because it doesn't apply to the students so much is the the benefits for the participating team leaders and for the teachers and other people who, who take part as adult um, organizers or team leaders so this is from a survey we did a couple of years ago about uh, based on how how where, where people who are participating in the olympiad were coming from um, there were other details involved as well that there are the national programs and so on but the interesting one here is 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 this this um, collection of, of, of where people come from as team leaders. Uh, about half come from university, like myself, the, the academics. The next largest number is school teachers. But then we have amateur astronomers. We have um, planetarium staff. Uh, we have observatory staff outside of, of, of the university. Um, there are even dedicated Olympiad centers in some countries which send people who may be not necessarily astronomers by profession, but are physicists or, 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 or other scientists or teachers working in, in dedicated centers for Olympiads and academic competitions. And all of these people get brought together in one, one place uh, at one time, and they get to talk to each other, they get to discuss the questions together, they share ideas, they share um, information, plans, projects, uh, things that they're, they're doing, things that work. So this is a, a very, I think, fruitful and useful side effect of, of organising the, the Olympiad. And for the students themselves, they can interact again with, with these academic team leaders that they might not otherwise have have been able to, to, to interact with. Um, the researchers on the, on conversely, they have to learn to work with, with, with students. They have to remember how to solve school level problems, which maybe some of them have forgotten uh, by now. Um, and the teachers are mixing with the researchers, like I, uh, like I mentioned, they're seeing, again, things that may be outside the curriculum. Um, all of this, this intermingling happens. And uh, also amateur and professional astronomers mix. Again, these can be two worlds that are often separate. Uh, we do our own thing, but the 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 effort required to to organise and participate in Olympiads, whether it's a national Olympiad or an international Olympiad, doesn't really matter. Um, requires really sort of all hands on deck. It, it 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 brings together people from different fields, people who can handle an amateur telescope to to present it to the students and, and come up with with tasks that they can do, and people who can do academic theoretical uh, tasks. And it brings them all together in ways that maybe they would not have come come together otherwise. So that's a, another benefit for 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 the astronomical community uh, more more widely. And we've seen we've seen through the growth process. I mentioned that we started with about twenty countries. We now have fifty uh, participating. We've seen uh, many countries starting Olympiad programs nationally, uh, just to be able to uh, put together a team and train them and select them and, and participate in the in the international Olympiad. And this has happened in Singapore. It's happened in the US, in the UK, in Canada, and in, in several other countries. And in many cases, this has been driven by people who participated uh, earlier on, whether it was uh, uh, as students or as team leaders. Uh, maybe a team leader has moved to another country, that's happened, or a student has become, for example, uh, the UK team. And that was the result of uh, one of our uh, gold medalists uh, from Romania uh, moving to the UK to do a PhD. They studied astronomy and then they, they moved to the UK to do a PhD and wanting to continue their involvement with, with the, the Olympiad uh, movement, as it were, in the Olympiad community and going around and badgering people in the UK until, until uh, they got to the right people uh, and were able to, to help organise uh, something, which is now, you know, they've moved, and that person has now moved, I think, to the Netherlands, but the UK Olympiad is, is very strong. And, and um, going very well, um, and in some countries, uh, it was it was the students uh, who wanted to participate in the next um, IOA. They'd heard about the IOA over the grapevine. They wanted to participate, um, and they actually organised uh, themselves 
found teachers, found academics who would tutor them, who would help with all the bureaucracy or, the, or, or getting that going. That has happened in Turkey, that happened earlier in Singapore, um, and, and again, other countries. So we, we're seeing this sort of ground up thing uh, of people wanting to take part in this and seeing benefit from that. And it's it's led to, to regional Olympiads um, and workshops for, for training students for competing on a, on a sort of intermediate scale between national and international. So EWAA is the European Workshop on Astronomy and Astrophysics. It's, it's a slightly fluid group of countries, um, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, Latvia, Lithuania, this sort of region uh, of Europe, which take part most years, um, sometimes more countries, sometimes less countries, again, bringing groups of students together and running a sort of mini mini Olympiad. Again, also more focused perhaps on learning and, and teaching uh, than, than just the problem solving. So they'll have lectures and things. And the OLAA, this is what Christian was, was also referring to, the, the Latin American Astronomy Olympiad, uh, which has been going since 2009. Um, in the, the Latin American region, and again, growing um, strongly there. I'll show a slide in a second. Um, and one other thing we wanted to do, the IOAA normally takes students from about 16 through, through 19 years of age, simply because the subject matter and the physics and the mathematics they need is usually taught at that, that sort of age level. But um, uh, we have this plan, which was slightly deferred by COVID, of, of, of having a, a junior IOAA for younger age groups, um, and hopefully that will start uh, next year. And we're seeing students who, when they, they came to, to the IOAA, they were thinking, well, maybe I'll study medicine or maybe go to other subjects, and, and they liked it so much that they, they stay in, in, in astronomy. And, and this is the graph of, of the growth of the Latin American Astronomy Olympia. This Christian sent me this, and you can see that there's been steady, steady growth in the number of participating uh, countries, the number of participating students, um, and also uh, encouragingly a uh, sort of trend towards sort of 50 50 uh, representation uh, between uh, male and female students, which is always something that we're, uh, we're trying, to, trying to figure out ways of. Of getting, getting more uh, more girls and women who are young women, young women who are interested in, in astronomy involved in that, um, and then giving them opportunities. Um, and uh, the sort of more prosaic maybe benefits uh, of, of Olympiads participating in Olympiads is that there, there's something that, that the media likes. Just like the sporting Olympians, just like the sporting events, the World Cup and football and so on, these are things that attract uh, attract media attention, attract the attention of the public, and thus attract the attention of government. And that in turn can be leveraged. Uh, you know, this, this is something that we can leverage as a community, the education community, for more resources for teaching astronomy, for getting more people involved, whether it's teachers, whether it's uh, pupils, whether it's parents even. Um, you know, getting them involved in, in, in spreading spreading the word and astronomy. And there's a little quip here, education ministries like medals, you know, they like to be able to say, yes, you know, our team, our team went and got all these medals. And it's, it's always something that, um, that can have good, good sort of repercussions in the, in the subsequent years as, as more of sort of the eye of government is, is targeted onto the astronomy community and maybe they're more willing to, to fund events and, and fund um, astronomy education in their, in their countries. And uh, even the resources that are brought together for either a national or international Olympiad um, can be used for other things. For example, telescopes, the telescopes that we saw in that, that clip um, and at other Olympiads, those are telescopes that after the Olympiad will be shared with schools, with astronomical uh, club societies. Again, giving, giving students uh, in those, those groups resources that uh, they might not otherwise have, have access to. And, and I already talked about the, the improved relations between uh, the, the teaching community, the amateur community, the professional community, especially in countries where maybe the astronomical community isn't very large, you know, organizing or an, an, an Olympiad team or organizing a national Olympiad or organizing an international Olympiad 
it really brings brings those communities together. They have to work together to make it a success, and it's it's again something that that um, works works for the future in terms of supporting astronomy education. Um, so we have, uh, if you want to have sort of more information, we have some. Um, we have a website, obviously, iowaastrophysics.org. Uh, probably if you type in International Olympiad and Astronomy Astrophysics into Google, it'll find it. There's also a YouTube channel which uh, has a convoluted uh, address, but if you if you type in IOA Olympiad into YouTube, it will it'll come up. And these are this is where we've collected films such as the one I showed you earlier. Uh, from various Olympiads, from various events, some of them are media, TV interviews, some of them are coverage of the, the event itself, where you can see what 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 it's like and what uh, what we're what we're doing. Um, and uh, there's also a Facebook page. One of the things we've noticed we have, of, of course, an official Facebook page, but uh, every year the students, participants, they set up their their own uh, sort of participants only, as it were, uh, Facebook page for uh, that year. So you have IOA 2019, IOA 2018, and so on, um, for, the, for the people who are taking part and they, 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 they use that to continue their friendships and, and, and to chat and meet and so on. So that's, that's another good thing, to, good thing to see. So if you want more, want to see more, then, then I encourage you to do that, to look at these pages. Um, of course, all the syllabus uh, and stuff is on our official page. Uh, not all of the past papers are there yet. Uh, we're still working on, on, on putting all of that in, in, in place. So, uh, do check back uh, regularly or if you if you want more information, obviously you can, you can come and, and contact me or, or any of the other people who are involved in this um, in this event. And I'll end. Greg, Greg, you've got about four or five minutes left. Right. Well, just, just later. This is okay, just no worries. This is the last slide. So this is actually a slide that I showed at the IU Shore conference um, um, uh, previously, uh, just as a sort of one one page summary for for, uh, for anyone who's uh, trying to sort of just uh, summarize what what I've been talking about um, in, in, in about this about the IOA and how it can how it can involve. Um, people in, in astronomy and motivate students in astronomy. So I'll just leave that up uh, up there and um, and any questions um, may have to answer. Greg, thank you very much. That's a really interesting insight into what goes on behind the scenes with these events as well. And um, just just from sort of personal experience in in the UK, which we we tend to think of as one country, we have four separate national curricula and six separate exam boards so how this is then pulled together over multiple countries multiple continents multiple languages is 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 mind-boggling um i've got one comment that i was going to pass on to you which was put into the chat and then we've got a couple of questions for you as well um so the comment i'll, I'll try and read it sort of um whilst uh <laughs> try and read it while speaking how hard should that be? So from Christian, who I think from I'm Brightly is in Colombia, he, he's saying something that I think everybody probably agrees with. The, this is an advantage of the Olympiads is, is that the students get to participate in, in sort of the future. They have options to sort of use this, I guess, on their CVs to win scholarships, to study universities. And obviously you're introducing them as well to this idea of scientific collaboration and, and you know, potentially collaboration across borders as well. So he he made that point. The the other two questions i think that are probably coming your way and you, you, you probably can can almost feel them coming already um one is from uh, our colleague talina who i think currently is in japan but is has had has a lot of work that he's done in sri lanka as well he says that these are great events he's seen students work hard and winning locally locally winning olympiads is considered a great achievement um <laughs> you, you you can comment or choose not to but how how do you feel from the organizer's perspective uh, are you competing with the ioa or the ioa and the ioaa competing and if so is that a sort of a friendly competition or and again you, you can choose to, to answer that as, as detailed or as undetailed as you like uh, right so um uh, yeah um we're not really competing with the IOA, uh, the IAO, sorry, the IAO. Um, we see it as, as two parallel uh, things. It's it's kind of like um, uh, you know you 
have you have five aside football and you have uh, eleven aside football. It's it's kind of fo it's football in both cases, but it's slightly different, and the two can coexist. Um, where uh, a lot of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some countries participate in both because they find the, 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 the types of problems are interesting in both and, and they think that their students can benefit from that. So we have no, no issue with, with competing with the, the other Olympiad um, and we're, we're very happy to coexist with them. Um, and we'll see you know, how both of, both of them evolve uh, in the future. Um, where they've been obviously around since 1996, we're a bit younger, but uh, we're also uh, growing. So um, I think there's a place for both. Um, what will happen in, in 10 years or 20 years, whether there there will be there will be two or, or there will be one, uh, we'll, we'll see. But I, I, I don't, don't see it as a competition. I, I see it as more astronomy better. Uh, you know, that's true. I, I have to say I prefer five aside because there's, there's far less running involved. Um, just to take that point one step further on, Rosa, I can see your hands up. So you're you're next after this as well. Um, uh, Christo Stoyev has, has take, taken that previous question a little bit further. He says there's actually an international astronomy and space science Olympiad that's planned for this year. Um, so in a sense, it sounds like there's a third version of, of football coming coming our way. Um, and, and his point, I suppose, which is, which is a, a reasonable point, um, will governments get tired of sponsoring participation across all three um, uh, regimes or across all three uh, disciplines? Um, well, I, I can't really say anything about this, this um, astronomy and space science uh, event. I haven't seen it um, happen yet. So we'll see how that, how that goes. Um, we don't really have much of a focus on space science. So maybe that's, again, a, a separate um, sort of parallel track that, that can happen. Um, I do know that some governments uh, uh, have asked their national organizing committees, uh, whatever form that might be, to pick pick one Olympiad to, to send students to and fund participation in. So yes, certainly that is a that is something um, uh, that's obviously in, in the back of people's minds. Um, but uh, but then again, there are other countries which are happy to to, to send students to both. So um, I'm I'm I uh, I mean obviously I, I would like the, this Olympiad that I'm most involved in uh, to to be a success and to continue for for many years down the line. Um, uh, I would not want that to be at the cost of somebody else's. Sure. Yeah. There's there's room for all, everyone exactly. at that stage. Rosa, you've been very patient. But your hand has been up. So uh, I think Rosa Duran would like to ask you a question. In fact, I know she would. Thank you, Fraser. I'm, I'm sorry for not putting the question in QA, but panelists cannot put uh, questions in the QA. So, Greg, thank you for this uh, complete overview of the Astronomy Olympiad. I, I, I have to admit, I learned a few things that I didn't know before. Um, my my question to you: You mentioned uh, that um, there are uh, there aren't many countries in Africa participating in the Olympiad, and uh, I I have mixed feelings against Olympiad. I do agree with many of the of the positive aspects of uh, Olympiad and participating in it and friendship and career etc. But uh, I have a feeling that. Uh, is kind of a world for privileged kids. And I explain to you what I mean with that. Uh, if you want to participate in the International Olympiad first, you need to be to have funding to go, of course, otherwise, but that's something that can be arranged. But uh, before you get to go, you need to be um, prepared at a national level to be able to participate and to perform in the Olympiad. And they are very challenging. The Olympiads are really top edge. So I think, for instance, we uh, in the Portuguese language office of astronomy for development work with several countries in Africa. I give you an example of Saint Domain Principe. Um, I, I wonder if the kids there, they, 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 have, they don't have any astronomer, they have some amateur astronomers and you know the field is starting to develop there or for that matter in Mozambique where few astronomers are, are there now. If kids from uh, any random school or many schools would like to participate in the Olympiads, they wouldn't stand a chance because it's too complicated. So uh, would it be possible to have uh, something like a MOOC 
or a training course where you know a student that says okay i want to do it i can do it by myself have some support that uh, is not based on local existence of people that can help uh, the student navigate towards that very demanding threshold that the olympiads require um I, I admit that we haven't considered the idea of something like a MOOC, and that is that is a, that's a, that's an interesting possibility that, um, that that we haven't come up with. It. And this is why meetings such as this are so good because we get new ideas. Um, and yes, I, I think absolutely that would be something that would be very uh, useful. Uh, one, uh, what we have been doing, uh, we have been in contact with. Um, astronomers, amateur astronomers, students, teachers from various countries um, who have expressed an interest in, in, in participating in the IOAA uh, at some point, not necessarily immediately, but, but in the future. And uh, between myself and Aniket and other people in the, in the IOAA, um, we've been helping, uh, helping them to, you know, Think about how to organize, what kind of things they need to do to prepare, and this kind of thing. Um, and so we, we've been talking to people from uh, from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from uh, um, several other places. Unfortunately, not as many countries from Africa as, as we like. Um, and uh, and yes, it, it is often a very much a problem of uh, not having uh, not so much not having resources, but not having the people um, around. Um, to, to, to do that, or maybe not knowing the people around to do that. So we've been trying to do that and, and help help with that as much as we can. And we certainly don't expect countries to be able to sort of suddenly from go from zero to sending a team to, to the IOAA um, and doing, uh, doing well um, immediately. Um, we try and help them build up their local organization, obviously we'll provide materials as much as possible. This is, I think, somewhere where um, I mentioned the National Astronomy Education Coordinator Program, and you know that, of course. Um, and this is something I think that will be very important in reaching, in reaching out to, to people and providing a framework from that. Um, I've been talking to some of the people from Africa that I know to try and get them into uh, you know, participating in the NAC program um, and, uh, and trying to solve this. I mean, it's, 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 it's a problem. problem. It's not, I, I mean, I don't want to sound negative. Uh, it, it's something that we need to, to solve. It's something we need to help in, in, in the countries that are privileged enough to uh, to be able to do this um, at the moment. Um, we need to we need to find ways to to assist those of our colleagues, uh, whether it's teachers or astronomers, amateur astronomers, professional astronomers in in these countries where maybe the infrastructure doesn't exist or the contact networks don't exist or whatever um, to to build that up. And and uh, I don't think. Participating in the IOAA should be like the first goal. I think building up the astronomy in those countries should be the goal, and and building up a national astronomy program, a national Olympiad program, uh, towards eventual participation in, in the Olympiad internationally is is one of the tools that we can use for that. Um, and um, yeah, uh, but uh, uh, this this MOOC thing actually we we had a question. Aniket and I had a question just the, the other week. I, I'd have to look at my emails to, to, to check where, where, who, who that was from, but there was actually somebody asking about training materials as well um, for, for, for people who want to, to prepare. One thing, though, that we, we can't do, we tried this once, and we, we, we didn't work very well, was we can't really have students participating on their own individually, because we, we, these are people who are, who are generally not adults. And, there is this aspect of, of, of care and, and for them that, that we need a, a national, uh, a repre an adult representative from that country to, to participate alongside them, just to just to look after their interests uh, when they're traveling or in the hotels or whatever. Um, so so we, 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 we did try it once and, and it didn't work out very well. So we, we have to discourage that. But it was certainly the, 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 the MOOC and, and the training course, I think is a good idea. I'll pass that on to Annika. And you, you, I believe you know Annika as well. Um, so uh, this is maybe something we can discuss uh, uh, in, uh, maybe at another venue uh, later on and move towards. Thank Sorry, I, I got carried away talking too no, much there. That's fine. I mean, Greg, 
as as with all of Jihu, a lot of this is about starting collaborations and starting ideas. Yeah. So we don't come to conclusions immediately, but yeah, definitely try to keep in touch with Rosa and, and the rest of the people that, that are keeping in touch with you yeah. and asking yeah. questions. Yeah, if I might just, because uh, uh, you, you also read out uh, Christian's comment, uh, sure. uh, which is a comment, not a question, but he did mention the the the, the career impact of, of participating in Olympiads, and and absolutely, this is something that um, that people like to have on their CV, and in some countries, there are tangible benefits. That is, there can be um, either sort of uh, grants or um, you know, sort of. It, it counts towards you know, university entry points or this kind of thing if you participate in, in the Olympiad. So there are tangible benefits in, in some countries, not all countries, different countries do it differently, but there, there are benefits to that. So, yeah, just Fantastic. No, that's, that's worth mentioning because, yeah, careers and, and the future are clearly what we're aiming at here. Um, thank you again, Greg. Really appreciate your time today. Appreciate the comments from, from the, the attendees as well. Gustavo, I'm going to hand over to you, I guess. You're going to tell us what happens next, which as far as I know, for those of us in Western Europe at least, is lunch, right? <laughs> yes, yes, me it's... too. <laughs> Thank you, Fraser. Thank you, Greg, for the, the presentation. Thank you for all the speakers who have been with us this morning.